In this hybrid meeting, uh, members of public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute uh, themselves and share their webcam. We ask that those attending to speak using the raise hand button to ask question or comment on the agenda item. Please make sure that your type name reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions or comment on the agenda items. Uh, at this time, members attending in person will introduce themselves. If for some reason you not you hear your name, please, uh, well, we'll hear your name because you're here. So that's, <laughs> that's old, old language from the old Zoom days. All right, uh, so why don't we go around and do introductions? Uh, why don't we start with Dave? Josh Schwank, Dr. Cog, just sitting in as support. Oh, okay. On Pabstorf, Dr. Cog. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog. Sam Kennedy, Dr. Cog. Greenwald, uh, Boulder County, City of Longmont. Jean Santon, City of Boulder, on um, behalf of Alex Hyde Wright with Boulder County. Jim Mormon, Adams County, and City of Thornton. Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Chris Hudson, Town of Parker. Kevin Ash, Weld County, uh, City of Frederick. Carson Priest with the TDM non motorized. Chris Quinn with RTD. So I, I, thank you for introducing me. So we're just going to do the introductions for the members and alternates. That's okay. <laughs> no harm. Want <laughs> to be here all afternoon. <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. We are now on to uh, public comment. Uh, we'll now open the meeting to public comment. If, um, if you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button. We'll call on you uh, to begin speaking. Joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine. We will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you, and then you'll need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up, and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will, be, will partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. Have anyone... All right, thank you. Now we move on to um, the April 25th, 2022 TAC meeting summary. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about the April 25th, 2022 TAC meeting summary? Any hand? So we will call those approved. And we'll move on to our first action item, which is the federal performance targets. On, uh, Alvin Vidal Sanchez is going to be presenting. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan Vidal Sanchez, pronouns he, him, his. The item I'm bringing before you today are our federal performance targets that we're setting. Uh, there are five performance areas that Dr. Cog is subject to. Uh, the one we're discussing today is the most expansive of them, PM3, System Performance, Freight, and CMAC. But we also set targets related to safety, infrastructure condition, transit asset management, and public transportation agency safety plan targets. For each of these, there's different reporting requirements, different data expectations, uh, different reporting pieces for Dr. Cog. So I'll run through each of those uh, for each applicable area. 
I mentioned it's the most expansive of the performance areas. There are four subparts. We're only discussing two of those today, traffic congestion reduction, which looks at the annual hours of peak hour excessive delay experienced in the urbanized area and non-single occupancy vehicle travel for the urbanized area. The remaining two, travel time reliability and freight reliability, I'll bring before you uh, later this year, early next year, once we've done more coordination with CDOT on those targets. Um, one thing we've kept in the back of our minds, I'm sure you all staff and you all have also uh, wrestled with, is what to do with 2020 data, um, the result of the COVID-19 pandemic on different metrics, mobility, travel in the region. Um, when those one-year estimates from the uh, census first came out, they were being called experimental. Um, the census cautioned against using them to inform decisions, comparing past directly to earlier years. So uh, that's been something we've wrestled with through this target setting process. Uh, we are using five-year ACS estimates, so that does help um, flatten some of those spikes or dips we saw as a result of that 2020 data. The first performance measures I'll discuss are traffic congestion reduction, so uh, annual hours of peak hour excessive delay and non-single occupancy vehicle travel. We set these because as of October 1st of last year, we were a designated urbanized area. We had a national highway system mileage, our population's over 200,000, and we were in non-attainment or maintenance for ozone CO or PM, uh, one of the particulate matters, specifically PM10. Um, the key piece here is October 1st of last year. I'm sure some of you all remember the presentation earlier in the year where we fell out of maintenance for carbon monoxide. Um, while that is true, the applicability determination was based on October 1st of last year, and at that time we were in maintenance for that pollutant, so we'll be setting targets for that pollutant, and that's why we're also setting traffic congestion targets. Uh, I've mentioned this briefly, but this does apply just to the Denver Aurora, Colorado urbanized area. So we have a number of different regions, areas as part of Dr. Cog, um, Dr. Cog, the MPO area. We're just looking at the Denver Aurora, Colorado urbanized area. So we're not including data or um, basing targets off of data from the Boulder or Longmont UZAs or the uh, Lafayette, Louisville, Erie UZA. This is going to be the second time we're setting targets for these. There are both two-year and four-year targets. I wanted to give you a snapshot of uh, whether we met our first round of targets. So starting with two-year targets for non-SOV travel and annual hours of peak hour excessive delay, moving from left to right, there's a desired trend with those. Do we want to be higher than our baseline or lower than our baseline? Uh, our baseline values and our two-year targets that were adopted. Um, for both of these, we did, um, in terms of our two-year observations, meet our target. A key piece of this is also whether we have been better than the baseline. So on some of these, as I get into further into the presentation, we might not have met the target, but we were better than the baseline, so we can still say we're achieving or making progress towards achieving our targets. And then for our four-year targets, again, the same structure set up the desired trend, our baseline, and our four-year targets. For these as well, we also did meet the target or we were better than our baseline for both of these. So we can say for our non-SOV and peak hour excessive delay targets, we have achieved both our two-year and four-year targets. A quick overview of our non-SOV targets. Um, again, it's the Denver Aurora, Colorado urbanized area. We use five-year ACS data, specifically how people are getting to work, and the calculation is really simple, 100% minus the people who drive alone to work. So that can include people uh, traveling by carpool, van pool, taking public transportation, bus, rail, walking, biking, or even the trips that don't result because you're telecommuting or working from home. So it's a really simple calculation, 100% minus that drive alone percentage. Uh, and a unique piece of these targets is that we set these uh, in coordination with CDOT. So both Dr. Cog and CDOT take the same action to set single unified targets for the urbanized area, whereas some of our other federal performance targets, we have the option to set our own as a region or support the states. Um, in this case, we're taking the same action for these targets. When it comes to non-single occupancy vehicle travel, we already have a target through MetroVision, 35% uh, by 2040. That was how we set our previous two-year and four-year targets, and that's what we're proposing similar this round using the same methodology. Um, because it is five-year data, you can see that the uh, disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 is lessened through that five-year data. This has been a metric that has been very difficult for us to move over the last eight years, even with some pretty significant transportation investments. So uh, our proposal is to um, use that last 24.7 value and project out what we need to achieve 35% by 2040. Um, so our two-year target is 26.7% and our four-year target is 27.7%. A key piece of this is that at the two-year mark, 
we can reevaluate that four-year target. So if we're seeing that 27.3 stable or increasing from that, we can reevaluate four-year target and make it a more aggressive target if we need to. I'll start this part of the presentation and pass it over to our partners at CDOT, but the peak hour excessive delay uh, is also the urbanized area. Uh, the data from this comes from the National Performance Management Research data set. There are a number of different data points that CDOT will discuss uh, that's included in that, but um, they developed a model that they're going to go over real quick that helped us set these four-year targets and two-year targets. And just as non-SOV, they are also setting the same target for the urbanized area as we are. pass it over to CDOT. Uh, they've been a great partner in this target setting process. We've been meeting about monthly, I think, since late last year. So they've been uh, really proactive in uh, data um, sharing coordination across the last six months or so. Calvin, uh, once again, William Johnson, CDOT, Division of Transportation Development, Performance and Asset Management Branch. Long title, introducing myself once again. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody had an opportunity to look through the materials. I will admit that they are kind of dense. I'm not necessarily going to go over every slide, but if there's something that you see, please let me know. And I understand I have a pretty strange voice. Can everybody hear me okay? Sweet. Yeah, um, I want to make it clear that when we look at federal performance measures, some of them have actual financial penalties, PM1s, PM2s, some of those measures do come with financial penalties, not for the MPOs. They fall mostly under the state, and it's not a penalty per se. It's more of a restriction. When it comes to the measures that we're discussing today, the PM3 performance measures, the only penalty that we have if we miss any of these targets is that the DOT has to road report. Now, when it comes to what is the, the ramification if the MPO misses a target, um, you don't necessarily have to write a report, but I'm sure during your, your certification, there will be questions that will have to be responded to, and that, that's it. So I, I just want to give you some assurance with many of these things that you know, there's really nothing that, that you can do wrong, uh, but there's plenty of things that you could do right. I also want to state that, you know, as we're looking at these, you'll see two and four-year targets. The full performance period is for four years, that two-year target is a mid-evaluation period, at which time any of these targets, the DOT can choose to go through and refine them, make changes to them. And what that does is if we choose to make any changes, the effect will be that the MPO will have a clock ticking and they'll have 180 days to make any subsequent changes. That's not to say that we'll make changes, but during the last performance evaluation period, we did make some changes because what we found was that some of our forecasting methodology was just lack of a, a better term, wrong. Now, peak hour excessive delay. We're required to do this um, for the state of Colorado as well as Denver, Aurora, and Fort Collins. It does not cover the full MPO boundaries, just those designated UZ, UZAs. Now, under this, um, sorry, I'm not going to read the slide, uh, we look at certain amount of data here, of course, travel time being the big one, certain amount of intervals. These are things that are required for us to use. Peak hour excessive delay as well as non-SOV, we have to use occupancy factors. We don't necessarily have a choice on how we get that. I know that for MPOs, we typically do a survey where you figure out how many people are in a vehicle. Uh, we don't. We're required to use what FHWA provides us for um, vehicle occupancy. We also leverage heavily information that is reported through other means. One of those would be like the Highway Performance Monitoring System, where we are reporting travel time data as well as AADT. Now, data used for forecast of peak hour excessive delay, uh, it includes travel time, uh, sorry, travel demand model information. Now, from this information, you're getting things such as anchor institutions, um, Work at home, I know one of the most common questions is, hey, does peak hour excessive delay include telecommuting? Yes, it does. We actually model those things, and from the model, we understand that what a work trip is. And if your work trip is from your bedroom to your couch, we're accounting for those commuter trips 
within the information. Uh, one thing that also plays heavily into this is what is the length of travel? So anything beyond your bed, uh, sorry, your bedroom to your couch, uh, we're accounting for those in, from the travel demand model. Um, and then we have other information in this, employees, students, uh, residents respectively. Why this is important, because during the first performance evaluation period, <clears throat> which was 2018 to 2022, we didn't have a great deal of information. So I started off with, yeah, we, we have poor data. Um, and this poor data is, uh, if you're looking at the comparison of where our target was during the last evaluation period and where we ended up with, specifically on things like peak hour excessive delay, we were way off. And for us, we were looking at what is the next level of model that we could develop, and we want to include many other factors. So besides the factors included in our forecasting, we also use predictive analytics. And um, some may say, well, that's a pretty big bite to chew. Ultimately for us is whether or not we achieve our targets again, um, the consequence of not achieving them is we write a report. We actually want to use those targets and use the forecasting to affect change in a positive way. So we're, we're trying to affect peak hour excessive delay and trial time, uh, so on and so forth. Um, population, uh, why level and pass transit data? Uh, that deals a lot with the length of travel for freight, um, where Loveland Pass is one of our, our big modal nodes. And so we're using that to understand what is the duration and length of travel specifically for freight. Uh, these are just roughly the modeling methodologies that we looked at. The big thing here, what we actually use are decision trees paired with random forest. Um, again, long story short, uh, classic linear model, that's what we used for our first iteration of targets. Um, you're really looking at very limited factors. Again, when you're looking at historical data sets that are poor, you end up with very poor results. And that's what we had. So to combat that, uh, decision tree random forest in a predictive analytics model was what we chose to use. Uh, what that is using is um, all those multiple factors dealing with population, distance, ADT, and saying based on these factors, based on thousands of iterations in a model, we're giving you a more accurate forecast. The model was sort of calibrated based on historical data and it looked good, so that's what we went with. If you don't mind, I'm gonna skip a couple of these slides. If you have questions, please ask me. Now, here's where we're at. Uh, for this, again, um, hey, we had COVID and COVID affected a lot of travel. And when it does that, your data tends to do weird things. And so for this, a lot of these years, we actually had to eliminate from the forecast. And our predictive model will give us the line in the middle, that blue line. And we used a 95% confidence level to give us a cone of confidence. And with that, looking at the data, looking at where the forecast has us, but especially looking at it in light of, hey, we're now recovering. We're seeing that VMT is returning or getting closer to pre-COVID levels. I wanna say that the last time I looked at the 2022 data, we were at 1% below where we were at in 2019. So we're sort of forecasting for that recovery and matching up that forecast to where we were pre-COVID and sort of tossing out the COVID data. That's where we end up with our forecast. And that is roughly the same story for all of this. We, of course, worked with other groups besides Dr. Cog. We worked with our multimodal planning. We worked with our traffic safety engineers, and we worked with our, our new freight branch to determine whether or not this represented a reasonable recommendation for a target. Point out again, that two-year target, that is our opportunity to course correct should we find that we're wrong. Questions, any questions? No one says, hey, William, we're lost in the decision for us.
Okay, so recreating that slide, our proposed two-year and four-year targets are 15.8 and 17.4. Like mentioned, at the two-year mark, we can reevaluate and see whether we are making progress, um, being better than that 17.4. Uh, but the pr proposals include the two-year and four-year targets based on the non-SOV and PHED values we just explained. Um, the des desired trend for non-SOV is increasing. The desired trend for peak hour excessive delay is decreasing. Um, so when it comes time to check whether we've made progress or achieved these targets, we can see whether we've been better than the baseline or we've met the targets that were adopted. Halfway through. Moving on to our on-road mobile source emissions targets. These are based off of uh, the different pollutants that Dr. Cog is subject to. So uh, for us, that includes VOC, PM10, CO, and NOx. I'm gonna do a similar run through of our performance, the last performance period. So across the two year measures, we did meet our targets and we were better than the baseline. So we can say across all four of those, we did meet them. Uh, same with our four year target. Uh, for those who did uh, go through the materials or are eagle eyed, you might see that uh, in terms of PM10, our baseline was 40.7, our four year target was 152, and our four year observation was 41.3. Um, we did not meet the target, but because we are better than the baseline, we can say that we are making progress. And so that's why you're also seeing that green cell and white check mark on that performance measure. But for our two-year, four-year targets related to CMAC emissions, um, we have achieved progress. Now we set these because we're an MPO that has non-attainment or maintenance areas within our planning area. The data we're using is what gets reported through the CMAC public access system. And like I mentioned, it's for each of our different pollutants. The calculation for this is also pretty simple. You add up the emission reductions that are reported for CMEC projects for two years to get the two-year evaluation and four years to get the four-year evaluation. And uh, these are also unique where we uh, cannot support the state targets, uh, so we set our own for the region. Uh, this slide's gonna have a lot of text. I will run through it so you can understand what was going through staff's mind as we were setting these targets because they are uh, quirky, you could say. Um, Emission reduction benefits are only recorded for CMAC funded projects. So if you have a project that is reducing emissions and it's funded with TA or Multimodal Mitigation and Transportation Options Fund, uh, CRP, it does not count towards these targets. So you're improving air quality, but you're not helping these targets uh, and helping us achieve these targets. Um, even if you have a bike ped project with surface transportation block grant funding, our most flexible funding source, um, that, those benefits are also not recorded through these targets. So we're only looking at the pieces of projects or the projects that are funded with CMAC dollars. Uh, the benefits are also only reported once, the first time that a project obligates. So if you've got a 10 year long project, um, we only record those benefits the first time that a project is obligated and you have the chance, uh, you get the notice to proceed from the feds, you can start um, getting reimbursed for eligible project expenses. So that one time is when we see those benefits. So even if you have an ongoing program, we're not gonna record those beyond that. We're in the middle of multiple calls for projects, as I know y'all are very aware. Um, so we as staff aren't able to forecast what some potential benefits might be. Uh, part of that is just air quality, improving air quality, reducing GHG emissions are just one piece of how staff evaluate projects. And it's one piece of how y'all as a, a recommending board and our different panels recommend projects to the board. Uh, funding type is also assigned on the back end from CHIP staff. So what funding is available, what projects are eligible to receive this funding. So we're uh, unable to forecast out what those potential emission benefits might be at this point. Um, our tip includes a number of set-asides that staff aren't aware of right now. So what are those projects in those buckets of funding? Um, we won't know those until those are solicited, evaluated, included, and reported through our annual reporting. Like I've mentioned, our CO maintenance period has ended. We expect our PM10 maintenance period to end later this year. So ultimately, uh, of the four targets I'll be showing you, two we won't have to set after uh, a reevaluation of our applicability. And through some work that we've done with CDOT, we found out that our projects account for roughly 74% of the state's total, 80% um, of the state's emission reduction benefits over the last four years. So we're a significant piece of the state CMAC program. We have eight years worth of baseline data. So on your screen now are the different pollutants or precursors that Dr. Cog uh, is subject to, nitrogen oxides, volatile organic compounds, carbon monoxide and particulate matter. The key piece on this slide is there's no real trend across any of these because it is based on obligation um, and just how the project moves through the development process. Uh, we're not able to forecast whether a project's, uh, any of these pollutants are increasing or decreasing in emission reduction benefits. So the higher the number, the better. 
but we are seeing some spikes across the data, uh, VOC, CO in fiscal years 2017 and 2021. So that was uh, something that we kept in the back of our mind as we set these targets. I'm going to run through three quick scenarios we looked at before we jump into what we're proposing for our targets. Uh, the first was looking at the last four years, which is our baseline period. What if we took the lowest recorded emission benefit and then multiplied that times two or and four to get our two-year and four-year target? So it's setting a floor for the region. Um, it's pretty easy to understand. Take your lowest value, multiply times two, multiply times four. Uh, but the con is optically, it looks like we're meeting the minimum. Uh, second scenario was taking the eight-year average for each of these pollutants. So um, for now on your screen are the different eight-year averages for each pollutant. The methodology would have been taking this value times two for the two-year target, times four for the four-year target. Again, pretty easy to understand. Uh, but in this case, it creates some pretty aggressive targets in terms of VOC and CO that we might not be able to meet just because of those spikes in the data. And then the last piece we looked at was replicating the methodology that CDOT created for their own statewide process. So they calculated a benefit per dollar, and they're using their program distribution to forecast out what emission reduction benefits they might see over the next four years. Um, if we did the same thing with the money that we've obligated the last four years, which are now on your screen, 30 million in 2018, 14 million in 2019, uh, 19 million in 2020, and 30 million in 2021, uh, we can also get a benefit per dollar. I'm showing you benefit per million dollars just so you can understand a little better not seeing 0. .00000. Uh, but with these, because Dr. Kaw can be a little more efficient in particular years, obligate more projects um, or obligate projects that have a bigger, a bigger uh, emission reduction benefit, we might actually have targets that are higher than the state's overall targets. And so uh, very aggressive to meet and exceeding the state's expectations over the next four years based on their own methodology for the state and program distribution. A quick screen uh, snapshot of those four-year targets looking at the different scenarios. Moving from left to right, uh, starting with our baseline, this is what we did see over the last four years for each of these different pollutants. Uh, they get more aggressive as you move to the right, uh, and in some cases, like the benefits per dollar, you're doubling what we just saw the last four years, so it might be unlikely to meet in the next reporting period. So we're taking, uh, our proposal is to take our portion of the state's targets across each of these different pollutants um, Dr. Cog, over the last four years, has uh, put their share into each of these. So for VOC, it's 86%, PM10, 66%, CO, 95%, and NOx, 73%. So our proposal is looking at CDOT's two-year targets. We take our share of those and commit to uh, meeting the state's targets through our own region and obligation of projects. So our two-year targets would then be 243 times 86% gives you our two-year target for each of those different pollutants. The four-year target is built the same way, taking our percentage of the state's targets and just taking our, our piece of the four-year targets. So we are, um, while we're not supporting the state targets, we are setting them for our own region. We're uh, using their methodology, so we're consistent with the state uh, and not exceeding their expectations over the next four years. Our desired trend for all of these and what will ultimately get checked on is whether we're better than the baseline or we achieve our target. So we're hoping to see increases in all four of these over the next reporting period. Um, these, just like the ones previously mentioned, also have a chance to get reevaluated. So at the two-year mark, we can see how we're doing uh, and either uh, increase or decrease the targets uh, based on what we expect to see over the next, the following two years. Um, at that point, we'll also have more TIP projects that we can look at, uh, TIP set aside, so we can see if there are more projects in the pipeline that could help us achieve our CMAC targets. We're before you today on our first step in adoption. Uh, hopefully, we'll go before RTC and the board in June. Uh, we're also moving towards a deadline of September 1st to have a report due to CDOT, uh, where we include these different targets in that report and how we're going to talk about achieving them and what projects are available right now that help us achieve the targets. 2022 is a busy year. We already took care of our safety targets. We're coming before you with half of our PM3 targets. Uh, either later this year or early next year, we'll come back before you with infrastructure condition targets, bridge and pavement, the rest of PM3, travel time reliability, uh, freight reliability, uh, and there could be the possibility of coming back on some transit safety targets depending on how uh, stuff flushes out at the national level and through RTD's process. So for transparency, the two-year, four-year targets, which are also included in your memo, are on this slide. They'll be included in any future resolution with the board as well. 
And the motion before you is to move to recommend to the RTC the traffic congestion reduction and on-road mobile source emissions reduction targets for the Denver, Aurora, Colorado urbanized area. I'm happy to take any questions. Do have any questions? How about a motion? Do we have, uh, you see the motion there on the screen, if uh, anyone would like to make a motion? Sorry, I wasn't quick enough. I actually do have a couple of questions. Go right ahead. <laughs> um, so um, regarding the UZA, Dr. Cog only required to look at the large urbanized areas. I know you mentioned like the Boulder, all our UZAs are left out. I'm wondering what the rationale is for that. Yes, uh, so um, the, the smaller UZAs are below 200,000, so they fall below the threshold that's been established by the feds to set targets for those areas. Um, for, for targets that we have a larger target at the regional level for, we've used that for our methodology. Um, but when it comes to PhD and non-SOV, the data and the targets we set are specific to the Denver Aurora urbanized area. And that includes uh, areas like North Glen, Thornton, um, down to Parker, Castle Rock, over to Golden. So um, besides those exclusions of the Lafayette, Louisville, Erie, and the Boulder Longmont areas, those are what we're covering with the data. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. And then my next question is related to options. So, um, in looking at the first target, which is related to non SOV travel, for us to look ahead to your twenty cause 2040 target of 35% non SOV. In the case of not have a similar sort of long range target, or are we really just going to be looking at this? Um, we do have a uh, like improve air quality target because these are so short term and are so uncoupled from a normal product development process, we wanted to keep these separate from that. So because it is based on obligation and it is based on projects that are only CMAC funded, uh, we can improve air quality across the region with our other funding sources as well, but those won't count towards these CMAC projects. So we didn't wanna keep those processes separate and um, we'll have the chance at the two-year mark to see how we're doing and reevaluate with that four-year target. Maybe we are being more aggressive and we can up that for your target, but uh, to keep them, to, we just wanted to keep them separate and keep those two processes. I guess to follow up, it, it seems like it might be nice just to have that context to even understand what portion of those CMAX projects are contributing to that benefit towards that long range. Anyone else with any questions? Brian. Um, I would also just add a quick conversation we had. Um, it's the benefit it, uh, reported. So like I mentioned, it's just the CMAC funded projects that we're reporting. Um, we expect to improve our air quality across all of our funding sources, TA with bike. They read my mind. That was my question. <laughs> All right. And else with questions? No questions? Do you have a motion? Sarah, go ahead. 
I'll make a motion to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the traffic congestion reduction and on-road mobile source emissions reduction targets for the Denver, Aurora, Colorado urbanized area. Second. Right. We have a motion and a second. Um, Please, um, if you approve or if you uh, support this uh, motion, please indicate so by saying aye. 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 Uh, if you do not, please indicate by saying no. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Next item on our agenda is informational item. Uh, five on your agenda is 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Greenhouse Gas Update. Jacob Rigger will be presenting this one. All the other technology issues we've gotten ironed out from the first meeting to this one, and then we have a battery failure. I blame it on. Okay, thank you all very much. Hopefully you can hear me. So after that last presentation, we wanted to pivot to something that's really simple, really straightforward, really easy to understand. All right, let's get into it. So the first three points that you see here, these are reminders from our last couple of meetings of what we've talked about with the GHG analysis. So as a reminder, um, per the state greenhouse gas rule, um, our revised regional transportation plan is due by October 1st. So we've talked about that before. We've talked about how the rule defines the baseline uh, for our analysis, which is the modeled, the 2050 plan as modeled when it was adopted back in April of 2021. And then we've talked about that the emission reduction targets that are specified in the rule for the Dr. Cog region are from that baseline. So those things hopefully are reminders. Based on the work that staff has done to date, and we're still sort of in the midst of I think Ron's used the analogy, we're, we're building the plane while we're flying it. Um, but based on where, we at, where we're at so far on our analysis, we think that the 2050 RTP can achieve approximately 70 to 80% of the reduction targets with kind of two key things that we've talked about the last couple of meetings. One is the telework adjustments um, that we've talked about, uh, what the rule had kind of had us assume as a baseline uh, versus kind of where we think more real, realistically we are now in this region. And, you know, sort of this idea of quantifying programmatic investments in the plan, which we'll talk more about today. <clears throat> so going forward, and, and we're going to talk more about this in this presentation, uh, we're doing kind of several things to get us the rest of the way to meet the reduction targets. We're currently testing some what I call some surgical strike strategic modifications to the 2050 RTP's project investment mix. Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk more about those in a second. Um, but even doing that, we think that there will still be a gap um, to meet the emission reduction target. So that's one thing that we're doing. Two other additional strategies. One is looking at near-term land use forecast adjustments. I'll talk about those as well. And then we're at least exploring the idea of entering into the GHG rules mitigation measure process. So we wanted to, you know, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of moving parts to this, a lot of things going on all at once. So we wanted to try and put just a little bit of structure and framework to the big picture steps in the process that we're trying to use in the GHG analysis for the 2050 RTP. 
So you're actually going to see this twice. I'm going to show you now at the beginning, and then we're going to talk through it, and then I'll show it to you again at the end where it will hopefully make more sense. But essentially, sort of number one and number two are things that we have talked about or things that we're doing now. Number three and number four are things that we're starting to do now or things that we're contemplating doing going forward, again, to help us get 100% of the way to meet the emission reduction targets. So you've seen this slide before. This is just a reminder. These come directly. This is Table 1 in the GHG rule, and it shows the emission reduction targets to which we are subject in the Dr. Cog region, as well as the other MPOs in this state and CDOT, um, because CDOT also has emission reduction targets in the nine MPO areas for the rest of the state. These are in million metric tons, and remember that they're by analysis year. So we have to do this exercise for 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. And then you've seen an earlier version of this table. Um, again, when we've been working on the baseline, again, remember the baseline is the plan as adopted back in April 2021 and as modeled at the time of adoption. So the first step was we need to calculate, okay, what is our baseline that we're starting from? So the first row, the GHG baseline, 21, 2021 RTP, in annual million metric tons. This is our actual sort of calculated baseline. Again, the plan as modeled when adopted. And then the reduction target, so reduction target, annual million metric tons required by the rule. That's what I just showed you um, in this kind of middle row comes directly from the rule. These are the reduction targets that we need to meet, that we need to meet by analysis year. And then when you put those together, then we can understand the percent reduction required from the baseline. So that's the bottom row. So for 2025, about 1.8%, 2030, just under 9%, and then 2040 and 2050, we need to reduce by about 10% for each of, those, um, each of those analysis years. So that kind of brackets a little bit the challenge in front of us um, that we need to reduce to meet the emission reduction targets. So let's talk about this slide a little bit. This is the programmatic investments. We've talked about this in a different form at our last couple of TAC meetings. The big idea here was that when we adopted the plan back in April 2021 and the modeling that we typically do associated with plan adoption to meet federal conformity requirements, you know, we include the major projects in the plan, as you've heard me say before, the lines and the dots on the map, um, and that's the focus of our modeling. But we know in the plan that there's a lot of what I'd call connective tissue, things that aren't identified as specific projects, things that aren't necessarily on a list, but they're in the plan, they're in the financial plan, they're things that make our transportation system work. They're all of these things that I'm not going to read to you because we've been talking about them the last two meetings, but they end up being a pretty significant portion of our fiscally constrained plan, and they're very important even if we don't typically model them or include them in, in our modeling analysis. So the big thing that we've been doing as part of the GHG work is to actually go back and understand how can we quantify the GHG benefits of these programmatic investments, how can we include that in our modeling to legitimately capture uh, the GHGS um, reduction benefits associated with these things that are in our fiscally constrained plan. So this is just sort of a reminder of these are the types of things that we're talking about. There's a little bit of unintentional nuance that I put in this slide, so I do want to explain it. The numbers that you see on the left here, the 18X and the 12X, this comes from directly from the GHG rule in non-Dr. Cog areas, because understand our model is, is frankly much more sophisticated than the rest of the state, and I don't say that to brag. It's just we have a very sophisticated focus model um, because we're the largest MPO in the state. Other MPOs have more basic versions of models, and so they're not able to model everything that we can directly in our focus model. So in the rule, in the mitigation measures, and I'll get to this in a couple of slides, they actually um, in the rule name specific types of strategies that other places that can't do it in the model like we can, um, can actually do an off-model analysis um, of these mitigation measures. So for us, these programmatic investments are things that we're trying to capture directly in the model, and they come directly from the plan. In other areas, there are things that a smaller MPO would have to do an off-model calculation. That's what those numbers refer to as sort of the relative benefit based on the scoring that's included in the GHG rule for these, you know, when considered as mitigation measures. Um, so not really super important to us in the work that we're doing at the moment. However, the reason they're here, and I'll go to the next slide, um, this was not in your packet. This slide and the next slide were not in your packet. Um, but we've also been working with our civic advisory group. This is a group that we worked with when we originally prepared the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. As a reminder of this group, it brings together people who are traditionally underrepresented in the transportation planning process, vulnerable populations that typically haven't had the voice um, that others have had in our planning process. 
And so it's either folks who directly represent those populations or folks who work with those populations. We met with them several times back in 2019 and 2020 to prepare the plan. We've been starting to meet with them again um, as we've been going through this GHG work. And we use that exercise with them of the mitigation measures that I showed you a slide ago um, to actually, you know, kind of work with them and, and sort of get their read and their sense of, you know, which of these mitigation measures or, in our case, programmatic investments they would support um, in terms of sort of if, if we're able to do these things in the plan, do more of them in the plan in particular, um, you know, where do they fall in terms of how do they support these various types of, of programmatic investments. So we did basically a before and after exercise with them. Uh, we did an initial cut just to kind of have them, you know, vote and show their, show their support. Then we kind of talked through each of these things with them, and then we had them kind of vote again. You see the results are pretty similar. Um, I think the outcome from that group that, that we took away was that, you know, they understand that all of these things are important for meeting our GHG emission reduction targets, but in particular, they really sort of gravitated towards programmatic investments that really sort of tangibly help in community investment, things that, you know, sort of capital investment that go on the ground or service investment like transit service that really sort of help benefiting communities um, as well as helping us meet, you know, at a regional level, our GHG reduction targets. So a couple more slides here. As I mentioned, we are currently testing some changes to the project mix in the plan. Um, we're exploring to see what implication this would have and what potential benefits this would have in terms of meeting our reduction targets. So I do want to be clear and transparent. The programmatic strategies that we've been talking about both today and at previous meetings by themselves will not get us all the way there. So we are testing some targeted, again, I call these sort of surgical strike, targeted changes to the RTPs, projects, and investment mix in the plan. What we're testing here is a couple things that you see listed on, on this slide, refocusing the scope of some capacity projects to emphasize sort of a complete street safety kind of multimodal component to those projects. Advancing some BRT corridors, remember in the plan, we defined a BRT network over the 30 years of the plan. We're exploring advancing some of those BRT corridors so that we can capture the GHG benefits of those projects sooner. And then we're also looking to see if we can make some changes in the plan to free up some dollars in our fiscally constrained plan and to use those dollars to actually invest in those programmatic investments. Can we invest in more of them and can we do it sooner, um, so more and sooner, so that we can actually capture those benefits uh, from those investments as well. Even if we do all these things based on our testing and our exploration so far, we believe that these concepts will not completely close the gap. So I want to be transparent about that. These are important things. We're testing through them right now. We're trying to see what the benefit is, but based on our initial work, they're not going to completely close the gap. So that leads us to two additional things that we're looking at. The first thing is what we're calling near-term land use forecast adjustments. So the idea here is that when we Land use, land use forecasts are part of part and parcel of every regional transportation plan that we do. It's actually federal requirements. It's part of our planning process. And when we prepare our small area forecasts, those are forecasts uh, for the 30 years, in this case, of our plan um, that we include as part of our key planning assumptions um, to meet federal requirements and to complete our planning process. What we have found over the last few years is that observed and anticipated housing construction through 2023 is actually at higher densities than we originally forecast, particularly in Denver. We're actually seeing the world starting to unfold, we think, just a little bit differently than we originally forecasted when we put the plan together. So it leads to a question, how will those recent land use decisions affect the remaining GHG gap? If we could sort of recalibrate and readjust based on what we're starting to see unfold in the real world, what kind of difference, if any, would that make in our GHG targets? If we do this work and we're exploring sort of the implications of this right now, it won't affect our federal air quality conformity model runs initially, um, but it's something that could be incorporated later. So if we see merit to the strategy, if this seems to make sense and it shows, it shows a tangible benefit, that's something that we can bring back eventually into our official conformity runs as well. So that's one thing that we're looking at. The second thing that we're looking at, um, as I've already previewed, is in the GHG rule, there's a specific component that CDOT put in the rule relating to what they call mitigation measures. These are things that are off-model, off-plan. These are sort of separate things, strategies that CDOT has been defining along with the working group that us and others around the state have been participating in for the last few months to actually define a list of specific measures and to sort of score those measures. You know, if I do this thing, I get X number of points um, that I can relate back to GHG reduction. So um, these are being defined in what CDOT calls Policy Directive 1610, um, that they're working through their process for adoption. Again, these are separate from our focus model. They're separate from the plan. 
Um, these are sort of off-model, off-plan strategies defined in the rule. Um, these mitigation measures are things that must be specific. They must be measurable. Um, clearly, they must be effective. Why would you do it if, if, there isn't, if, if they don't show a, um, a benefit? And they need to be able to be tracked over time. So there's kind of a multi-part test um, to these mitigation measures. If we were to go down this road, um, the Dr. Cog board would need to adopt something called a mitigation action plan. Um, that comes directly from the rule. If you're going to use mitigation measures, you have to put them in a plan. Um, by our board adopting them, it's sort of a regional agreement. Yes, we're going to do these things. We're going to track these things. We're going to report on these things on an annual basis. So um, we're going down this road as well because, again, we're trying to use every tool in the toolbox to be able to meet the reduction targets. So preliminarily, and we're doing this right now, but we're exploring parking requirements and, excuse me, and zoning-related density increases near rapid transit stations as potential mitigation measures, and we're testing those now. So this is my second to last slide. Other considerations based on everything I've said today. Without the mitigation measures, and I want to be transparent about this, based on the work that we've done so far with these other things, without the mitigation measures, other strategies may not be enough to close the GHG emission reduction gap um, that are required of us. So I want to be clear about that. So, you know, leads to a question, okay, but what if we didn't want to do mitigation measures? It comes with a plan. You know, as I said, we have to meet this multi-part test. You know, what if we didn't want to do that? So what's the implication of not doing mitigation measures? Well, if we're not able to meet our reduction targets and we decide as a region not to do mitigation measures, then in the rule, and this is specified in the rule as adopted, um, it would affect project eligibility restrictions on federal funds within the Dr. Cog MPO area. So let me be clear about that. If we can't meet our targets and we choose not to do mitigation measures in order to meet our targets, then the implication, the consequence of that directly in the GHG rule is restrictions from the rule on our federal funds for project eligibility. If that happened, that would affect project eligibility for the 24 to 27 TIP calls three and four that are coming later this year in early 2023. So I don't say that to scare you a lot, but I do say it to be transparent and frankly to scare you a little bit. This is where we're at, and I want to be transparent with this group about that. So having said that, let me sort of end with where we started. Um, hopefully this makes a little bit more sense now. We started with the baseline as defined in the rule. Uh, we started then in step two um, with sort of the mitigation, or excuse me, with the um, programmatic investments in the plan. Uh, we're now in step three where we're looking at the project mix investment changes in the plan to see if that gets us there. And then step four is some of the land use and mitigation measures that we're starting to look at to see if we need those things to get us all the way there. So I have said a lot. I'd be happy to take any questions on this. Thank you very much. I had his hand up first, so I'm calling him. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, j can you go back a couple of slides, Jacob, to that one more? Thank you. We, we probably should have added one more bullet to this because it's not just a restriction on um, STBG funds and CMAC funds that are allocated through Dr. Cog. Um, uh, it, it, is, it also is a restriction on CDOT's use of 10-year plan funds uh, to only projects that would, that would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not just funds that are allocated through Dr. Cog or, or kind of allocated to projects uh, by Dr. Cog. It also, affect, it also restricts CDOT's use of funds within this region, 10-year uh, plan funds. So, uh, sorry I missed that, Jacob. That's probably another bullet we probably will want to add to this. No, it doesn't just affect us. So your hand up. So, Jacob, we just completed our transportation mobility master. We're actually reducing six to four. How do we get that community so you can put that into the market? Probably change both investment, basically um, construct gases. Yeah, can't, I'm sorry to say that again. The middle part, you're reducing. We're, we're reducing the number of lanes on a, some of our streets from uh, future at B6 to four. Um, some places four to two. Yeah, like let's have lanes. that conversation because if those. If those roadways are on our regional roadway system and they're they're captured in some are you know, plan, then yes, we would want to know that and we would incorporate that. Thank you, Brian. When you talk about land use forecast adjustment, there's been the R word discussed, and what would that mean to your forecast? That would assist that would address absorption, that would address 
session considered that. I'm not quite sure which R word you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we were all guessing. I was making you guess. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start and answer and invite others to sort of participate. Um, from my perspective, Brian, so first, you know, a lot of this stuff, and not just land use, but let's take land use, is a snapshot in time, right? And we, you know, we do this work and we update it frequently because the world keeps changing pretty frequently. Again, I think what we're finding, what our land use team is finding, is based on recent, you know, sort of history and the anticipated near-term future, so far, it looks like our forecasts are different enough that it's worth trying to account for. Obviously, that doesn't speak to what could happen with a recession or otherwise going forward. But over the 30-year cycle, and we have the same conversation when we talk about fiscal constraint, well, what about a recession? What about this? In our 30-year land use forecast and, and in our fiscally constrained plan as well with our fiscal constraint estimates, we do account for economic life cycles. We do try to understand that over 30 years, things are going to happen both up and down, and we try to account for those in the sort of the life cycle of the things that we include in the plan. So I don't know if that's directly getting at what you were asking, but that's my first take on, on your question. I, th I think Jacob answered that perfectly. Um, we, for we don't forecast the highs, we don't forecast the lows, right? Our forecasts are sort of based on averages and acknowledging and knowing that there are economic cycles over the course of the 30 years. So any given year, we could be way off. On average, over the 30-year forecast, we usually do pretty darn good. Yeah, and the reason I'm asking is, you know, you have different targets to meet over those periods. And so when we t start talking about some of the projects, right, we're looking at delay to meet the targets at that time or acceleration to meet the targets. Same thing I would think goes with. Any other questions? I think that so Jacob, um, you mentioned that in the case of the density or, yeah, I guess with, related to land use and the densities um, have been, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I think, but you said it this way, have been outpacing the estimates. Could you just talk a little bit more about that? And, and the reason I bring that up is I remember back when we were doing the RTP exercises, land use was a component of how the network functions. Yeah, I think what I'm going to ask, um, since I'm not our land use planner, but we do have one here. Um, Zach, would you mind coming up and answering that directly? Because I don't want to put words in your mouth. So while he's coming up, Zach Feldman, our senior... Manager of Data Analytics. I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I have to check my... Um, I think maybe I'll back it up and put into context two areas that we're seeing major change. Uh, one is that um, the forecast for the RTP years ago, and the data for that was uh, so the data for that was older. Um, we we can update that with what we see on the ground. The second piece is that we're bringing in new um, subscription data sources that cover um, master plan communities in particular, but also large scale um, rental development. So in some sense, we're trying to track the changes to um, the economy in the same way that there was discussion, of, are we seeing a recession? And, and the demography office can, can guide us on that, but we're also trying to get a better idea of um, what's happened on the ground in the last three years and what we think will happen in the next but a half to three years. Does that get at the question? But I guess I was also curious on, so I think Jacob uh, mentioned that a lot of it was occurring in Denver. Are there other areas of the metro area that you're seeing more increases than had otherwise been anticipated? Uh, really anywhere that you would expect large um, apartment development. Um, we're able to track that better than we could three years ago. So that's going to pop up. So uh, around uh, the med school and the VA, for example, um, tech center, um, 
anything down around um, Lone Tree, like um, down towards like the new Schwab and Sky Ridge down those areas. So anywhere that you would see large scale apartments, we can track those better. And then with the master plan communities that are primarily single family developments, some townhouses, uh, we're, we're previously we had a good idea of what the um, kind of described max size would be, and now we have a better handle on that rate of building over the next five or so years. So those are the two ways that we'll incorporate that. We'll um, large single family development, mass public community, we're tracking it well, and if it's large um, apartment buildings, that's the type of thing. So not strictly Denver, um, but Denver has a lot of the um, apartments that we can, and you can also see it around just by looking at cranes. Other questions? Go ahead, Phil. I think this was asked at the April meeting, but I just want to idea of how are we paying for the mitigation measures that you're talking about in the um, talk about the mitigation measure. Last time the question was asked, but not. There was I don't we don't. Wondering if there's any been if there's been any more conversation about paying for those mitigation measures. Yeah. So let me clarify. When it comes to mitigation measures specifically, you know, as specified in in the GHG rule, mitigation measures are more. I don't know. Policy is quite the right word, but they're more policy oriented. They're not. They're not projects. They're not things that somebody would pay for per se. They are things that, again, if we did it, we would commit to tracking. You know, we'd have to adopt the mitigation action plan. We'd have to track them over time. We'd have to report on them. Again, all the things I mentioned that are associated with mitigation measures in the rule, but they're not, but they're meant to be sort of things that not so much are paid for, but things that the region would commit to doing. Is that getting at your question, Phil? I take a stab as well. Uh, there's a whole lot of things that are listed in the policy directive as mitigation measures under the rule that we view as transportation investments that are included in our regional transportation plan are funded through our TIP. We're, we go back to that graphic, Jacob. We're accounting for those things in step three. We're exploring adjustments to the regional transportation plan and looking for ways that we can increase our planned investments in those multimodal investments, accelerating BRT corridors, those types of things, changing the mix of investments in the plan. Under our structure, those are, those are plan investments. That's happening in step three. Those additional investments, those change in investment strategies are not, the way we're approaching it, mitigation measures. If we get to the mitigation measures piece and a mitigation action plan, we're focusing on non-transportation investment sorts of measures, things that are, are more than those investments, those things like land use strategies, parking strategies, development strategies, other things that can have an impact on travel behavior and help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So we would only be focusing on those non-transportation mitigation measures the way we're envisioning this. So any changes in, you know, other things, other other areas, other other folks might use and call those things mitigation measures. We're not. Uh, we're we're tackling those in what's kind of step three here. That help, Phil? And then that's within our fiscal constraint. We figure out how to pay for those, right? What are the trade-offs? What, what, what dollars can we move around and adjust in the plan to pay for those things? Brian. I know the answer to this, but I want to make sure that it's on the record. So at the board meeting, there was a comment made during the public comment period about uh, Greenhouse gases being applied to individual projects in the TIP. Just address that. My philosophy, Brian, is uh, to always try to ask questions that I know the answer to. I'm not always successful, uh, so I appreciate your attempt. Um, we have a board adopted policy for how we develop the TIP. Uh, we very much um, have incorporated um, uh, assessment of air quality, 
uh, air pollution and greenhouse gas emission impacts of projects, but we're not doing a specific project by project evaluation. Um, the rule requires us to evaluate our plan at, at kind of a system level, the full the, the full impact of all of the investments in the plan and in the TIP, not an individual project by project. Because quite frankly, the project level sort of evaluation is, is not, we just don't have the tools, right? You had a whole conversation about the performance measures, right, for CMAC funded projects. The tools just are not great. Um, and so we do our best and we require information as part of the TIP applications to try to get a handle on sort of the relative impact on um, uh, emissions and air quality benefits from projects, but uh, we don't we don't have the tools and our and the tip policy does not have a project by project sort of specific evaluation uh, of of air quality or greenhouse gas emissions. And Ron, I would add to that as well that going back to federal requirements, the tip implements the plan, and so and that's part of why the four tip calls are structured the way that they are that we're going through this process now, again, to amend the plan or revise the plan by October 1st. Once we do that, then we can sort of release tip calls three and four because it will be based on the plan that has gone through this GHG work and meets the GHG requirements. And that, in a sense, sort of protects or overlays the tip calls that come for projects that are already in the plan, have gone through that uh, regional plan analysis for GHG, and, and the tip at that point is implementing the GHG-approved plan, so to speak. As I thought, thank you. Sarah? Thank you. I appreciate all the work that Dr. Cog is doing on this. Very complicated and appreciate the work going into looking at the RTP and what we can do to um, turn the dial so that we can meet the greenhouse gas uh, requirements. It does sound like that we're headed on a path that um, we'll likely be able, we, we'll need to do the mitigation action plan. and. What I'm hearing is that this may impact, if we don't meet the greenhouse gas targets, we will have to implement a mitigation action plan before we can even look at calls three and four. Is that correct? That is correct. Appreciate it. And so just to clarify, if we did need to take advantage of the rules, you know, mitigation measure process and prepare a mitigation action plan, if we did that, that would become part of the universe of everything that we're doing that's in this graphic. Um, that would become part of the revised plan that would become part of what the board adopts by October 1st. So the, all those things would go together. Okay. Um, going off of Sarah's question, um, so would that potentially impact the timeline for calls three and four? That's so easy, I'm gonna let Ron answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say I wasn't going to answer it. Uh, we don't know. I, I think if we if we come up with a successful strategy for a mitigation action plan, if we have to get to that point and we adopt that, and the the transportation commission agrees with it and and endorses it and says yes, you've met the the requirements of the rule, it shouldn't have an impact on the tip schedule. Um, if there's if there's some policy decision, if there if if we can't come up with an acceptable mitigation action plan and we get to sort of the fund restriction piece, that probably does affect the, the TIP cycle. Ken? Uh, a little more on the uh, action tracking. Is that going to be tracked by Dr. Cog's staff or individual locals? What's the uh, uh, right? So if we went down that road and we actually did adopt a mitigation action plan, Yes, we would all work together as a region. So I don't want to say it's one versus the other. We would all work together um, to track the measures that are in that plan. And so, yes, probably Dr. Cog's staff, in a sense, sort of leading that, but working in partnership uh, with all of you around the region, depending on the measures, to be able to track sort of the status and the progress on them. Any other hands? Any final questions or thoughts? Oh, go ahead, uh, Chief. Yeah, um, one one question. So, in the way that you've described the mitigation measures, it does sound more policy oriented, like land use, such. Um, in in um, and from my understanding, the um, thoughts for or the transportation policy related to the mitigation is that and scores related to projects like what is a bike lane worth or you know related projects. So is it 
your understanding that you would just take a, a, a selection of what's included um, at the state level and apply it here? Yeah, so again, and admittedly, this is confusing, but think of this as kind of a hierarchy. We do these things and then these other things and these other things. We are able to include many of the things that are in the GHG rules to find mitigation measures. We're able to include them directly in our modeling work. And so, again, like I said, other you know, smaller MPOs can't do that. For them, they truly are mitigation measures. They have no other way of doing that analysis. For us, many of those things we can and are including in our modeling work. And so they're part and parcel of, of our plan and our modeling. And so we're able to address them in that way. So the fact that we may still need to look at mitigation measures, we're looking at other things that are not, again, sort of project-based or building something based. They're more kind of policy-oriented. Um, that they're mitigation measures, but they're things that we otherwise couldn't include in our modeling or in our plan. That's kind of our logic. Does that answer your question, Jean? Uh, yeah, partly. I guess my question is more holistically with what the Transportation Commission reviewed um, last week. <laughs> um, did that also include, did that list of mitigation measures and related benefits also include these types of policies and score those? Or was it just infrastructure projects? No, my understanding is that it was both. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, so and, yeah. And a, and a provision in the policy directive that was adopted at our request, an, an opportunity for MPOs to bring forward other potential mitigation actions if we could demonstrate that they actually were achievable, did benefit greenhouse gas emissions. We want. We felt it was really important for us to be able to explore other opportunities, other things that might help us get there and bring those forward. Obviously, they would have to be reviewed and they would have to be approved as part of a mitigation action plan. But, you know, with all the good, really good work and good research that CDOT did and the state did to try to come up with that, we didn't believe that CDOT could anticipate every potential action that might have greenhouse gas benefits. Or, you know, it it really was looking at national data or statewide data, and we might have better strategies, better things that might fit this region and be more effective in this region. We wanted an opportunity to sort of bring those forward and, and at least explore including them in a mitigation action plan. But we're not completely restricted by that list. I guess how I envision that list, that list is sort of a safe harbor, if you will. If you want to do other things, it's not so safe. It's treacherous waters, but if you can demonstrate, if you can show that is beneficial um, and, and the commission ultimately agrees, then, then you can do those things as well. That's all the questions we have for you, Jacob. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, our next item, which is item number six on your agenda, is complete streets network prioritization analysis. Emily Kleinfelter uh, is going to be doing the presentation on this one. hear me okay yes all right hi everyone um, I'm Emily Kleinfelter I am uh, new to Dr. Cog's staff as of this year I am their dedicated safety and regional vision zero planner um, so I'm really excited to, to be a part of this team and to be talking to you all today about our complete streets work um, so just a little like to set the tone um, if you aren't aware we last year in 2021 saw almost 43,000 lives lost on our roadways um, whether people were biking walking driving um, whatever they, whatever, whatever mode of transit they took, um, we saw that many lives lost, and that was 10 and a half percent up since 2020. Um, so safe, complete streets are of the utmost priority to our region. Um, complete streets are safe and context sensitive, and they're inclusive and equitable and flexible. Um, and so I think that's something to, to take into account as we move forward in this. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide. So uh, hopefully everyone is aware that in October of last year, the Dr. Cog Board did pass uh, the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit, um, which is intended to support 
support the implementation of the 2050 RTP um, and also provide resources for our different jurisdictions to um, do complete streets implementation. Uh, and so with the passing of the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law this year, um, that has been requiring a development of the complete streets prioritization plan. And so uh, Dr. Cog with Tool Design Group, who helped us put together this toolkit, um, we enlisted them and extended the contract to have them um, help us execute a prioritization analysis of the different segments and locations in the Dr. Cog network um, that could use investment. So what we did here, we, just to, to bring it back, we have this uh, complete street story map, which is the first of its kind for, um, I think, actually, the whole United States. But this is um, a super cool story map that you guys can check out later um, to understand more about what exactly are the complete streets, uh, street types and to dig more into um, what our, our regional network looks like. So like I was saying, the bipartisan infrastructure law is calling for a prioritization plan with complete streets. And so this is to identify um, locations that should be um, improved for safety, mobility, and accessibility. And so uh, what we did here is Dr. Cog has you know, a multitude of different planning um, activities that we've done in the past that you'll see here, different planning initiatives, including the RTP, um, our Regional Vision Zero Plan, the Active Transportation Plan. Um, I don't need to list them all out. But what we did is we took all the data that is included um, from these different plans and we put them together in uh, one data set, one GIS layer file, um, to understand where we should prioritize our investments. And so since I did mention that uh, complete streets are context sensitive, not each and every one of these data sets was given the same weight. Um, I'm not going to break it down for you guys right now, but within each of these different data sets, um, different ones were given a high, medium, or low level score. And so that's how we were able to ultimately um, create a model that allowed us to find a prioritization of the locations along the network that should be um, used for, or should be um, invested in for safety and accessibility. So I unfortunately was not able to get our um, actual map up live for you. So all I have are screenshots right now. But this is what, after all of that work was done, we took all of those different data sets, whether it was the environmental justice areas, um, the short trip opportunity zones, pedestrian um, zones, our bicycle and pedestrian networks, all of this was overlaid and given different levels of scoring based on their priorities. And this is the first base map that we got, um, which is the, the darker the color it is, the, the higher the score it got. Um, and this here is a score of 15 or above, meaning that the darker it is, um, the more it is falling into the, uh, all of these different categories. It's going to be in an environmental justice zone. It's going to be on the high injury network. It's going to um, just meet all of these different criteria that we were looking at. And so um, obviously within prioritization, you want to kind of start to narrow it, out, narrow it down and have my even more ranking. And so when we start to filter it um, based on another level, this is um, a score of 20 and above. And then this is when we look at them uh, having a score of 23 and above. And so that's really where we're going to start taking those, these locations, these segments, and starting to dig deeper and understand where are these places across the region and what's happening there and what projects are already occurring and what's not occurring and what can we do when it comes down to complete streets. Um, and so the results from this exercise, from this prioritization analysis, um, oops, sorry, one more. That's actually the very last one, 23 and above. Um, but so the analysis, the results from this are really to help you all and to help us um, identify locations, whether it's a, a long segment or just an intersection, um, that would be a priority candidate project um, for the new funding opportunities that Ron's actually going to speak to in a moment, as well as um, the TIP and um, also the RTP. So. Yeah, I think that's it I have for you guys. It's a really quick little um, thing for me, but any questions? Questions? I will ask a question, if you don't mind. Uh, so going back to those maps, just so I make sure I understand what the color means. So you're saying it's almost like that's potential for improvement, those scores? Is that a way to think about it? Yeah, so if okay. you, this is what the entire network looks like with all of their scores, whether it's a score of two or all the way to 25. Um, 
And then as we start to break it down with the higher the filter, yeah, this is, you'll, you'll see those, those corridors that we always talk about, right? You'll, you see Colfax is highlighted there. You see your um, federal. And those are areas that are showing up as having the, the priority scores, whether, you know, high injury network or critical corridor is given a highest score if it's on that. Um, if it's an environmental justice zone, that's going to get a high score. And so the more that it was feeding or that it was checking those different boxes, the higher the score it got and was saying, you know, this is a, a location that we think meets all of these different criteria for investment for um, safety and accessibility and mobility. Mm -hmm. Um, is, is the map available online yet, or is there a spreadsheet? How can we find out um, where our corridors lie and where their scores are? So we are still in the cleaning up process of this. Um, I wanted to, uh, to show you guys the uh, web map that we have. Once that is cleaned up and totally ready for the public, we will make it publicly accessible, but right now um, it is just internal. Um, but we hope to have it as a similar tool within the toolkit like the story map. Um, unsure of where it's going to live, whether it's within the story map there, so that you know you could keep scrolling. And we have okay, here's the the network. Now turn on a filter, and here is the network prioritized. Um, not quite sure yet, but that's something we've been thinking about. Thank you. And it'd be great to also see it county by county. That will really help with the tip and the sub-regional prioritization. Yeah. Thank you. Wanted to um, thank Emily, um, Jacob, and the team, our regional planning and development team, the GIS team, for kind of putting this together. Really was a great opportunity to tie together a lot of previous regional planning work into something to, to try to, I think, uh, kind of how we view it as maybe tiering priorities, right? We know we've got, a lot of, we've got a lot of needs out there, a lot of priorities, and you can't do everything at once. And so if we can identify sort of some tiers of, of priority investment opportunities, help, help us all sort of focus um, and, and bring to bear the resources we have to address the highest, highest priority opportunities, bringing all of those planning efforts together. So really excited about this uh, as an initial step. Emily, thank you for your work. Emily's, uh, for folks that haven't met Emily yet, Emily's relatively new to the team. Uh, really glad to have her, and she jumped right into this uh, into this effort and uh, working with our GIS staff to bring, a, I think, a tool that's going to be really useful to all of us. Again, thank you. Um, I, I think this tool will also not only help in TIP discussions, but also in the federal grants that the discretionary grants show in a region. Yeah, that's another thing we're hoping that this tool will be really useful for is that Ron will be speaking to is this. I, I'm especially excited for the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant that was just announced last week, and we're hoping that this will be a great tool for ourselves and others to use um, in part of that grant application process. Also, will this have any impact on the current tip? Coming calls as far as scoring or? I'm going to direct later. That <laughs> not, not in terms of scoring, Phil, but I think hope, you know if this if this is useful to local jurisdictions to identify potential um, projects uh, for the for the next calls in the tip. I certainly wouldn't you know as this as this becomes. I would I would use this to to look for alignment with your local priorities and sort of what's what's coming out of this work, um, and would encourage you to consider projects that align um, with sort of the higher priority opportunity uh, tiers here. But it's, we're not we're not anticipating incorporating it into this tip call specifically. Other questions? Not a question. I just want to say thank you. The the Complete Street uh, Regional Toolkit has been really helpful as we're putting these TIP applications together, and this is going to be even Thank you to the whole team. And also, feel free to reach out if you do have any questions or comments, because I think one thing that this is, we've done a lot of work on it, but I think that there's still more work that could be done. There's other uh, criteria, I think, that along the, along the way we could be adding in. Um, something I think is important for me is taking into account um, the age of our population. 65 and up is the largest growing population. And that's something that we didn't put in this town in this round, but I'd be interested to to look into the next prioritization round is that kind of work. So if you guys do have any input on that, I'm always open to the feedback. Emily, what's the, what's the anticipated time frame for kind of getting the final cleanup done and kind of getting this published and, and accessible? Um, 
we hope most likely in mid-June, I would say. Any of the other questions? So great job, Emily. Thanks a lot. All right, the next item up is item number seven in your agenda, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act Grant Programs Update. Ron, you're going to do this one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to do this from here. This is a, a fairly quick update. I know we're running a little, uh, getting kind of close to the end of the meeting. I don't want to take a lot of time. Uh, we have updated and included in the packet sort of a table of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act discretionary grant programs. Uh, so you know, changes a bit, but it's our best, it's our best effort to capture um, the various transportation, uh, surface transportation highway uh, discretionary grant programs. A number of these have come out. There have been no, no notices of funding opportunities released for the RAISE grant program. So there have been a number of applications that were submitted by CDOT and, and local jurisdictions as part of the RAISE. We, we don't know the results of that yet. Um, the, the, uh, there was a combined NOFO for three grant programs, the infra program, the new mega projects program, and the rural surface transportation program were sort of lumped into one notice of funding opportunity. That one just closed, I think, today. Yes, that's right. That's right. Closes today. Yeah, so I'm sure many people are still scrambling to get those applications in. Uh, you know, so we're starting to see those rolled out. Uh, Josh has pulled up on the screen for folks. This is this is one list that U.S. Department of Transportation has published on their website that lays out some anticipated timeframes uh, for for upcoming uh, programs. Not it doesn't have all of them. Um, I know our friends at FTA noted that there's there's one or two that are sort of FTA related discretionary grants that. U.S. Department of Transportation didn't put on this list. This is not my list. We didn't compile this. This is straight off of U.S. DOT's website. Uh, so apologies to our regional FTA friends, uh, that it, but uh, not our list. So they can talk to their bosses uh, about getting their programs on there. But it is a good resource. And, um, and, and is, in fact, uh, between the time that the uh, about the time this agenda packet was going out, um, the U.S. Department of Transportation did issue the notice of funding opportunity for the straight, safe streets and roads for all program. Um, uh, they had in, they had said they were going to get it out in May, and by golly, they got that NOFO issued in May. That came out about midweek last week. We're still we're still reviewing that NOFO. Uh, quite frankly, there and there will be some resources out. I anticipate that at the next. TAC meeting, we'll have a more detailed discussion of that because I think the NOFO came out in a way that maybe we hadn't quite anticipated. So we want to have a conversation with all of you um, about that and how we're positioned and how we should pursue that um, opportunity as a region because I think it's, it's a little bit different than sort of some other grant programs that are focused very specifically on very local projects. This seems to have a bit of a focus on sort of a more regional collaborative approach. So I want to start a conversation with that. The good news is I think recognizing the challenges around that, uh, U.S. Department of Transportation gave a pretty, an unusually long lead time on this NOFO. So they issued it last week. The, app, the, the uh, program closes in September, which is a, an extremely long lead time for most of these, uh, unlike most discretionary grant programs. So I think that's an acknowledgement of a need for a bit more of a regional discussion about setting some priorities and how we might want to pursue that. The good news is, as a region, we're positioned really well because of the work that you all have done with us over the last several years. So we already have a regional Vision Zero plan. We already have a complete streets toolkit. We've already done some equity analysis. Like there's a lot of stuff that we've done together over the last few years that I think positions this region well to be uh, particularly competitive uh, for that program. So I think we're um, we're excited to have that conversation and figure out how we how we can best pursue those those. So this was mostly just to get this in front of you. I would, we'll share out. Uh, there's links. I think they're live in the agenda packet uh, from that. I would encourage everyone to check out the notice of funding opportunity for the safe streets and roads for all programs. So you can kind of be prepared for next month's discussion about that. Um, and other than that, we'll, we'll keep talking about this. I think we, we all just want us to be successful in competing for these uh, competitive grant programs to build on the formula funds that are that are flowing into the state and the region. So that happy to have uh, answer any questions. Sure. A quick one. Thank you, Ron. Um, for the safer streets and roads for all. So um, 
you're thinking that maybe individual communities don't need to have a safety action plan to apply, that perhaps the Dr. Cog taking action on Vision Zero could cover the whole region? A really good question, Sarah, and I, I, I'll say this. I, I don't know for sure. Um, we're, we're all learning as we go on this one. I, my, my initial read, I would, I would say that if, if there's a regional approach and a regional application, I think we can fit that under the umbrella of the region's Vision Zero plan. If a local jurisdiction wants to go after an application themselves, the way I read the NOFO is they're not eligible for an implementation project unless they've done the safety action plan. And so if you haven't done a local Vision Zero plan, my read would be you're probably not going to be competitive for an implementation project. But if we're part of a consortium and take a regional approach, even, jurisdic even projects and jurisdictions don't, ha don't have a local Vision Zero plan, I think we can tie that under the umbrella of a regional Vision Zero plan. Does that make sense? And again, I don't know that I'm right. <laughs> I don't know if everyone heard that, but um, Emily says uh, a webinar that she participated in, they suggested that to be eligible for an implementation project, the local jurisdictions has to have done the action plan and committed to Vision Zero. I was actually looking at the application before this meeting, and I think that might be one criteria among several. I don't think you necessarily have to meet every single criteria, but again, we're all just looking at this fresh, so. <laughs> I, I fully acknowledge that I may be wrong. <laughs> but, yeah, so look at it carefully. Um, Ken. Um, thank you for this list, Ron, and one of the things that uh, I think it was mentioned in a previous TIP meeting, but put it on the record again, what you put together for your graphics, the process, that map is very helpful, and we've used federal grants. I, I would encourage Dr. Cog to not take that down after the TIP process, but let's try to work program updated on any worth having that. Okay, any other? Any, all right. We are through the informational items on our agenda. Uh, a few administrative items. Uh, we've got a member comment or other matters. Does anyone have any comments, members they would like? a couple of quick ones. I talked about the safe, safe streets and roads for all NOFO. Um, two other things I just wanted to, you, you probably are all aware, but last week the Regional Transportation Committee and the Board of Directors did adopt your recommendation allocating the first regional share uh, funding allocations uh, for the air quality multimodal project. So that was fully approved by the board uh, last Wednesday evening. So uh, that, that came through without any changes from your initial recommendation. And then um, on your next agenda next month, I, we have been having some initial conversations internally about sort of, it's probably time for a review of the TAC committee guidelines. We do, we're do. we kind of interested in exploring sort of the membership structure and sort of revisiting, kind of freshen up those guidelines. So uh, anticipate that we may we may start that conversation with you all at your at your next meeting, just talking about maybe some opportunities for things. And uh, we've got AMP working group update uh, that uh, got that right. Okay, go, go ahead, Carson. Yeah, sure, just really short today. Um, we met earlier this month as an AMP working group. We talked about one main agenda item, the regional mobility data platform concept white paper. It's a mouthful. Um, the working group discussed roles, responsibilities, and some expectations coming out of this draft. Uh, that's really the only update I have, Mr. Chair. I'd, I'd take questions or direct them. Questions? None? I I believe we're through then. A couple of member co uh, comments uh, and other matters. So uh, our next meeting is going to be June 27th, 2022. And with that, we are adjourned.